Coming up on DTNS, Sherlyn Lowe from Engadget is here to help us understand the current state of foldables. And we look at the hybrid workplace from a study on some of its pitfalls to some new tools to help make it work smoother. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, Monday, spooky September the 13th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Joining us in Gadget Reviews editor, Sherlyn Lowe. Welcome back. Hi, thanks for having me again. Yes, it's good to be uh, uh, on the internet with you. Last, last time we met was in person at CES a few years ago. Oof. Uh, I doubt that will happen anytime soon, but hey, maybe yeah. maybe someday. Uh, we were just talking about bees and oh, yeah. uh, some technology to perhaps get rid of them from your picnic area, as well as some other things. Uh, get that wider conversation on our expanded show, Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. That is where you can join top patrons such as David Mosher, Dan Voiles, and Logan Larson. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Epic Games announced that it will appeal U.S. District Judge Yvonne Gonzalez Rogers' final judgment in the Epic versus Apple lawsuit, which largely ruled with Apple in the case. The Apple Court is, is expected to rule on Judge Gonzalez Rogers' definition of the market at issue, which she defined differently from both companies, and possibly clarify the language of the injunction requiring Apple to Apple links to alternative payment options. Apple said it's still evaluating whether to launch its own appeal of that injunction, but if I put my money on it, I would say that would happen. Firefox 91 lets users set it as a default browser in Windows 10 using the same one-click method found in Microsoft's own Edge browser. Previously, that required going into settings. Now, this isn't officially supported by Microsoft. Instead, Mozilla reverse-engineered the exclusive Edge feature and circumvented anti-hijacking browser protections. So it's a vulnerability, I guess. An internal Google document names October 4th as the tentative release date for the Android Open Source Project, or AOSP, source code for Android 12. In past Android releases, developer source code re release and consumer pixel release are typically on the same day. The Financial Times sources say Chinese regulators plan to split Ant Group's Alipay's credit business into an independent app. That would see Ant hand over customer credit data to a new credit scoring party, partly state-owned joint venture. Regulators also plan to crack down on other online lenders, not just Ant, but Ant's the most prominent of them. Also, China's Ministry of Industry and Information Technology advised tech companies to stop blocking links to each other's sites. Tencent restricts users from sharing links to ByteDance's Douyin and WeChat and QQ. Douyin filed a complaint in court in February. And Alibaba's Taobao and Tamil marketplaces do not allow Tencent's WeChat Pay to be used as a payment option either. Tencent and Alibaba said that they would both comply with the guidance. And the MIIT also announced Monday it believes that there are too many EV makers in the country. And it encourages consolidation. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little more about Zoomtopia, not Zootopia, Zoomtopia. Uh, one is possibly more fun than the other, but at the annual Zoomtopia conference, Zoom unsurprisingly made a lot of announcements. One of the biggest features is the expansion of real-time transcription. Back in February, this was announced to be coming to free accounts with English language support, but now the company says it plans to add support for 30 languages by the end of this year. So it's not just coming in the fall to English, it's coming to 30 languages by the end of 2021. For paid accounts, the company also plans to add real-time translation across as many as 12 languages by the end of next year. No word on what the languages will actually be. They didn't announce the list yet, but it will be powered by machine learning tech that Zoom acquired with the startup Kites back in June. Zoom is also expanding the functionality of whiteboards, these currently are available when you are in an active meeting, but the company will launch Zoom Whiteboard outside of meetings in Zoom apps and the web as a beta later this year. So you can revisit it just like you could a real whiteboard if you had walked in an empty conference room. In other words, Zoom is building productivity tools for teams to use when they're not on the call. And next year, Zoom will be coming to Facebook's shared VR meeting space, Horizon Workrooms. Users will be able to host video meetings in VR, use whiteboards, and interact with those on traditional computers. So all mixed together, VR won't be a refuge from Zoom fatigue <laughs> for very long. Uh, Sherlyn, do you do a lot of Zoom conferencing these days? Too many. 
way too many. <laughs> Any of these features uh, feel like they would make your life better? <laughs> I, I feel like real-time translation is something that's been a, a dream across the tech world, at least on the software side, for a long time. I, and there's been a lot of device makers that made earbuds that promise to do real-time translation as well, so that when you're you know traveling in a foreign country and you have one of their buds on, you can pretty much in real time hear what other people are speaking to you, but you, know, you don't have to go to the trouble of learning another language, I guess, or whipping out your phone and using Google Translate. Um, I feel like we're still pretty far away from it working the way you would see in a science fiction movie. Um, it's it's not as fast yet. The devices we have, the processes that are in place, the machine learning models, they're just not that quick. They're still not even that accurate. If you look at like Google Translate, there's colloquialisms that get left along the way that don't get translated very well. Um, I speak man I speak Mandarin and various Chinese dialects, and there's so many nuances between the different dialects that like that's also hard to capture. So anyway, I'm interested to see what Zoom's going to do. But on, I mean, especially because of that, like that, I think that's something that people have been asking for for a long time. Um, everything else just seems like Zoom's trying to encroach on Google and Microsoft's uh, market share in their respective spaces. Yeah, I, I do. A, well, I watch a lot of things on Viki uh, and even the human translators will translate the same phrase differently yeah. when they do the previously on than they did in the actual thing. So real time machine learning translation has has a long way to go. I also I do not host meetings or attend meetings in VR, but mm. I am a VR enthusiast mm. and I would love to know who says this is actually a you know a, a great advancement in how we can be together while not together because i know that th there's a huge conversation that's been going on for you know a couple of years now yeah. about you know how how do like how, what are we missing by not being together yeah. um if anything or how is it actually better for productivity and the vr part of it is I just don't know anybody who does this regularly, but um, but I but I would love to know if you do and if you you find it helpful. I suspect that the reason you haven't seen a lot of people do it yet is just because there's just not a lot of apps out there and and devices out there that enable like a realistic um, translation of your body and your being into VR just yet. Um, I think if you look at devices like uh, Hololens, Microsoft's Hololens, and the most recently announced was uh, Facebook had its own, you know, the the one that actually um, Zoom is going to use. Um, there, there's attempts at making this. I agree with you that like it's not there. There's not a lot of like loss of body language cues or whatever if you're not, you know, if you're doing a Zoom 2D, I guess, uh, <laughs> call, you probably get enough yeah. cues to understand, but. I think there is something to be said about sharing the same physical space, even if that physical space is virtual. Um, I did do a bunch of like so-called immersive VR style meetings. Um, Tribeca Film Festival, I think earlier this year was held sort of in person. So they created this sort of exhibit hall for us to run around like our avatars. And mm. <laughs> God, there's still so much that needs to be done on the device side. like. Before you it's, yeah, of, like yeah, fun you see a lot of people like have, yeah, treadmills on to simulate the walking because you don't want to run in place, but you also don't want to run into a TV. Mm. Um, <laughs> and then yeah, they just don't pick up like your gestures very well just yet. But I did give a industry friend like a fake hug, and it felt kind of weirdly nice. I don't know <laughs> why. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, I mean, probably because you know, none of us have hugged a lot of other people yeah, in a right? long time, so yeah. it's cool, you know close enough. <laughs> Well, on that on that remote work versus in-person work <laughs> note, Microsoft published research in the journal Nature Human Behavior of a study of the effects of remote work on its 6,100 employees. A lot of employees. That mm -hmm. study covered December 2019 uh, through June of 2020. So six months or so. The study found it hindered communication and also collaboration and increased work hours. Employees spent less time communicating outside their teams, less time in meetings, but more time in instant messaging and also in email. This meant less information was shared in real time and more in asynchronous ways. And information was less likely to be shared across the organization overall. Bonds within teams were strengthened, but collaboration outside those teams dropped 25%. 
The scientists recommended taking proactive measures to help workers acquire new information across groups. Now, keep in mind that 82% of Microsoft did not work remote before the switch in March 2020, and the switch happened very suddenly. So these takeaways don't necessarily include a lot of time for employees to learn how to adapt to remote work, but it's the study nonetheless. Yeah, I feel like it's the first crack at, okay, what what do we know from those first three months? But I'm waiting for the next study because I think that will be even more informative as to this is what happened when we first started. And after a year of doing it, which we'll have data on, right? Because we've been doing it that long. Mm -hmm. This is what people learned. This is how they adapted. Because I think the real question is, what are the behaviors you have to proactively correct for? And what are the ones that that people will learn how to do. Maybe you can speed them along by giving them some tips, but I, I think we've all gotten better at it since June of 2020, for sure. Yeah, I think that some sort of hybrid workplace is going to be where we ultimate land, uh, ultimately land. I think that for my workplace, it's almost always been hybrid. We've got so many people that work in you know, remote locations or or places where we don't have headquarters or offices that they just, you know, completely do the remote thing. And then for me, I've just always had an office to go to, but I never felt the need because it was never enforced, right? I didn't have to go in every single day of the week, which is a luxury at the time. Right now, though, I think that if, if we move forward, people who want us to have a real office space should consider letting like workers who can do the bulk of their work from home, um, never mandate, I think, a, a certain requirement of days in the office. Because I think if if workers like myself have the freedom to dictate like what our work schedule is in terms of going to a physical office and meeting up with people, then that's where you find people have that creativity and that, that sort of brainstorm that people say we're missing from not being in a physical office. But once you enforce it, you're going to drain that creativity away anyway. Like that's my take. <laughs> Especially in a, like, a job. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I miss is free lunch. But <laughs> when we used yeah. to get a free cafeteria lunch. I, I, I used to eat in Gadget's free lunch <gasps> in our San Francisco office, even though it wasn't really for TechCrunch when I worked there. But I was like, well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Just, it's free. Yes. Free lunch. <laughs> free weight, free pounds and free calories as well. <laughs> That's, that's uh, yeah, I mean, and we're, the, you know, bringing up hybrid work, there's going to be all new things to learn once people are doing hybrid work and what that means. Yeah. Uh, and uh, with that shift to hybrid and remote work, uh, we're going to need new tools. Uh, in fact, that sudden move in March 2020 to remote work put a strain on the product supply chain. Uh, if you remember trying to buy a webcam in April 2020, it was almost impossible. It's because Camera makers like Logitech thought no one would buy anything, so they reduced their orders, and then they were wrong because everybody was buying cameras because they suddenly had to work from home. A year and a half later, we're starting to see that industry catch up, which, I don't know, might be good news for the general chip shortage out there. We'll, we'll see. Uh, but we're getting the first product cycle for productivity tech made with work from home in mind. Logitech recently announced the $399 Logi Dock which builds on a typical USB-C dock, doesn't have a camera in it. Uh, it has power pass through, bunch of IO ports, and offers an integrated noise canceling speaker phone and physical controls for video calls. So it's meant specifically to sit in front of you and make it easy to control your video conference. It'll even do some light up effects if, it, if you integrate it with your calendar, let you know your conference is coming. Dedicated video chat appliances have also been given a new life. Google introduced the $2,000 Google Meet Series One Desk 27. That has microphones, speakers, a camera, and a touchscreen whiteboard on it. Microsoft is working with a lot of OEMs, Jabra, Neat, Poly, Yealink, to integrate AI-powered speaker tracking into video conferencing appliances. That keeps you in the center of the frame. It can also do things like split out people in the same room into separate camera instances so they look like everybody else on the Zoom call. Startups are also getting into the game with a $300 webcam that might have seemed like a silly idea in 2019, Opal announced the C1, which claims to offer DSLR technology on a webcam in styling that would look at home on top of a premium laptop. Uh, you know, you're gonna be looking at it all the time. Maybe you want it to look nice. It includes a larger 4K Sony image sensor about the size found in a low end point and shoot, uh, an F1.8 lens and offers noise canceling mics. Uh, so we're 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 finally getting those stylish high end home cameras for the discerning uh, Man, user. Four hundred dollars yeah. for the Lodge Dock. That is a lot. I mean, yeah, doc, docks expensive. are usually two two or three hundred dollars. This is at the higher end of the range for sure. Yeah, yeah. I don't it, know. It, 
struck it struck me as 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 quite high. But yeah, we're 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 getting to the point where companies are getting very creative about making your experience as great as possible. It's sort of like I don't know. It almost seems like the early days of Instagram where it's like this filter will make you look better or you know make your photo look better. It's it's all sort of about uh, making your experience as pleasant as possible because this is the reality you live in. Yeah, apparently we all need to have home offices now. I think that's also why, like, as everyone builds out a home office, Logitech can charge whatever the hell it wants for its really powerful dock that is very compact and can fit a lot of things in it and do a lot of things like light up with the calendar events. So, I mean, I'm intrigued, but I don't have a very sophisticated home office. I'm never going to get one anytime soon. But that DSLR webcam, though... I I would I uh, would check it out. I would snap on a ring light over it. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, because currently I use the Logitech Brio uh, on our live streams and stuff like that, and that one's good. It's like constantly sold out, like you noted, Tom. But it's not DSLR style by far. So I I'd love to see what the startup can do, what its hardware can do. But yeah. Yeah, and and we didn't go into it much, but there's a lot of uh, aspects of these being sold with easier provisioning. Uh, mm-hmm. Which is another thing as as companies are buying the setups for their mm-hmm. for their employees to work from home as they as it becomes more of a permanent thing or a hybrid thing where they're only going in a couple of days a week. Uh, so there's a lot of those kinds of features out there as well to make it easy to to set them up uh, for people because the three of us, you know we we could all set up a, a webcam just fine, but you want you want to make it easy for your entire workforce to do it, even if they're not as savvy with cameras and and USB protocols and all that sort of thing. I feel like the more people get these uh, pieces of gear or are able to get it for themselves and set up their own home setups very easily, the more we might see a rise in like people not needing organizations or companies at all and, and just more small businesses and more entrepreneurs, I think, yeah, rising yeah. out of all of this. Well, one, one thing I noticed in David Pierce's article on protocol is Logitech saying they hadn't really thought about cameras in a long time. And I'm like, yeah, it showed. Like the C920 <laughs> was a workhorse. It's a great camera, but I kept waiting for the really good next one. And they hadn't, they, he basically admitted like it sold well. We had 90% of the market. Like we were kind of resting on our laurels and then pandemic came and kind of shoved everyone into innovating. Yes. So, yeah. I hate patrons of the show. Uh, if you are a patron, you might not know that you have an ad free RSS feed where you can have just DTNS or. Just Good Day Internet, which is the expanded show, or both. Check your tier on Patreon. See if it says DTNS, GDI, or all in the name of your tier. And if you want to change, it's easy. Just change tiers at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. Well, foldable phones are the new hot thing, at least they want to be, uh, with smartphone makers right now. In fact, we we talked with Shannon Morse on Friday's show about her enthusiasm for foldable phones. But how well do they work? And more importantly, should you be investing in one? Thankfully, Sherilyn is here to help us break it down. So, Sherilyn, how long were you using the foldables uh, from wherever they came from? Tell tell us about what, what you've seen so far. So Samsung's foldables are kind of where it's at right now. Um, Just launched in August. So I've had them since mid-August, about August 11th, I want to say. So basically a month. And I, you know, also had experience with prior versions of Samsung's devices and other companies' foldables. Um, Specifically, I think one comparison that keeps coming to mind is the Surface Duo. That's not necessarily a foldable. It's really like a dual screen phone. And um, yeah, there you go. Tom's holding up the yeah, <laughs> Surface Duo. It's, it's Basically, the difference is it's actually got a hinge. It's not trying right. to have the screen go across. Yeah. The the if we're gonna do a straight comparison, the Galaxy Z Fold 3 is the is the one that really compares a bit better with the Surface Duo because it's it's two phones in one, more or less. Whereas the Z Flip 3, which is the other device that Samsung launched this year, um, is the Motorola Razor Flip style um, phone, which is like one phone but it flips the folds in half. So I mean the one that's more interesting, I think, to everyone right now, and the one that I could even recommend people buy like a, as a mainstream phone is the Flip 3, um, which is the one phone that folds in half, except for the fact that its battery life is kind of bad. It's 
how okay tom sarah how long can you go on your phone nowadays before you need to charge it yeah i used to have to plug it in all the time i, mean, I have now, to charge my phone overnight about, pretty much yeah overnight every pretty night. much okay yeah. so every night this phone won't get you to the night like it won't <laughs> you can uh, charge it overnight and then like before the evening or maybe in the evening you'll be like at pushing you know, zero or 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 five percent, depending on how much you've used it. For a few reasons, I think because it has a larger external display than before, and uh, it's got a one twenty hertz refresh rate on its inside screen. So things that sap battery that you can possibly turn off if you wanted to to save, but it's still kind of an issue. Um, the other guy, the bigger guy, I. <laughs> Ooh, excuse me. Um, same as the Surface Duo and and Tom, let me know if you have the same uh, experience. <laughs> he might. I, I don't reach for it as a like regular phone. And then yep. the only time I really enjoy using it is when it's like it's a big screen immersive experience, which is when I have to intentionally and consciously decide to do something on it, like play a game, read a book watch a movie that I, for some reason, don't want to watch on my TV, so I'm in the subway or on a plane or something. So it's for very specific use cases. And then as just a phone, it really is a very perfunctory kind of thing where, like, I get the basics done, and I'm I'm never going to be idly scrolling Twitter or Instagram or Reddit on this phone because it's too narrow, too heavy as a single phone. And, and yeah, so I think, Tom, you were saying, right, you have similar experiences with the Duo? Yeah, I was going to say it's pretty much exactly the same. Uh, probably less call for me to do video on it because yeah. it has the hinge gap, <laughs> right? right? Uh, and so I was, you know, I was like, oh, I'll put a, 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 a TV video up on the top screen and set it on the coffee table so I can kind of have, you know, <laughs> poor man's picture in picture. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I mean, I did that a few times and then I never went to make sure that I did that. I right. really liked reading on it yes. like eBooks, but again, like you said, I had the same experience, not reaching for it to do that, yeah. not remembering to go get it. Yeah, totally. I, 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 I will say that there are people that this device will serve well. I think if you're a person that kind of wants a tablet, but doesn't really want to spend on a, a separate device and don't need such a big screen or you, you travel a lot, which few of us are nowadays, but maybe we will again. Um, and then if you're like a super huge tech aficionado, you're like, oh my God, the technology is so great. I have to try. I think so. Yeah. I mean, Samsung's done a really good job of things like making sure the cameras are the high-end cameras you expect from paying so much for a device. It's $1,800 for the Fold. Um, and then there is software in there that Samsung's done to make this a more productive, like a multitasking device. So you can use apps side by side. You can drag and drop things. There's a flex mode. There's a new edge panel that you can pin to the um, side. So it looks like a taskbar on Windows sort of. Which is kind of nice, but who the hell is typing on this thing like it's a laptop? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Maybe you will, but it's not me. So not and not everybody. Really, not a lot of people. I know one, Sherlyn, one person who's I, a big I, fan oh, of the Note uh, yes. who loves the Fold, but that's it. Go ahead, sir. Um, I, I for, for for I know there are a lot of people who say like foldables, but how are they gonna you know withstand the test of time? Yeah. I mean, what do you think about that? You know that 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 crease situation and how yeah. and how it'll be you know if you buy a device that's eighteen hundred dollars mm -hmm. what's going to look like in three years yeah no this is not going to last you three years because no one's going to be able to be as careful as like you need to be with this thing for that long i think you're going to either trade it in for the next version when it comes time or um you're going to break it at some point right and um to your point sarah about the crease the crease isn't it's it's something that someone I think on a YouTube video that we made commented saying, Oh, how's the crease? Or like I bet that thing creases over time. And I was like, huh, you bet. Um, excuse me. They've been from the beginning of time with foldables. The crease has been there, they've always been noticeable, but not so obvious that you can't read anything on it. Um and I think that that's something that we've learned over time that we just have to deal with. You have to just kind of suck it up. It's gonna be there's gonna be a crease because it's a thing that it's remains part of the design. Folded. Yeah. Yeah. As for like the the durability of it, the external parts I think and the hinge, Samsung's gotten pretty good already with this current iteration. The screen though, even if it's stronger, I would still say that if you ever close the phone with a key or a grain or a crumb in it, 
you you might you might find that yeah you've scratched something but mm -hmm. i don't know it's 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 hard to say how it depends on how careful you are with phones anyway right like i drop i have like seven cracked phones at home because i can't stop dropping them because they're all <laughs> yeah. slabs of glass nowadays yeah. you and me both sister <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you threw the Flip 3 in your bag, though, and it and it survived, so that's that's a good testament, right? Yes, the Flip 3 is stronger. It's the screen where it's like, I can't, but the the outside, the where there's no screen mm -hmm. showing, um, I definitely feel much safer with them. And yes, the Flip 3 almost feels like it might be more durable for the fact that you can fold it and put it away. Keep that screen protected, yeah. Mm -hmm. I love the Flip 3. I honestly, if its battery life wasn't so bad, I would buy one for myself. Yeah. Well, sounds like the Flip 3 might be the closest to a recommendable foldable that we've gotten yet. Yeah, and I feel like we would might need to wait one more generation for mm -hmm. it to like sort out some of these kinks, but it, we are at the point where if people are curious and rich enough that I would be like, okay, if you want to spend that money, go for it. It's 999, it's cheaper than before, which like it's the same price as an iPhone more or less now. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, real quickly before we uh, wrap up, the dream of the modular laptop has another champion. Intel has entered the ring, uh, offering its next unit of computing, or NUC products, as bare-bones mini desktop. Uh, and they've been doing that for years, but Intel has released a variety of mini PC form factors as well, from the 2015 HDMI-connected Intel Compute Stick to the Compute Card in 2017 and the similar Compute Element, most recently in 2019. Now... The company is using that compute element module for a laptop. You can just swap out the innards of your laptop like a card. The NUC P14E laptop element is a 13.9 inch laptop reference design that supports the U series version of the NUC 11 compute element which always contains some brand of Intel processor, it varies, you can configure it, storage and a built-in operating system and can be swapped between the laptops. The P14e laptop shell is the key piece though. It contains a 3000 by 2000 display, Wi-Fi 6, all your IO ports and a battery. CPUs in the compute element range uh, go from Celerons to Core i7 with Iris Z graphics and vPro options on i5 and i7 CPUs. So the reference design will likely be sold directly to companies and government clients, while the swappable compute elements make sense for fleet management. So you can buy a bunch of these frames, and then if you need to upgrade somebody's computer, you can leave the frame and just swap out the compute element. No word on if Intel will sell a bare-bones version to consumers, though, uh, like they do with NUC desktops, but... I'm sure we can hope that maybe they will. <laughs> this is a very niche product, so it's very hard to, but but people are very hype about their modular laptops though, so. It's a dream. It's a dream to have a modular laptop. I don't know how, how realistic the dream is or yeah. if people will even use it if yeah. it comes along, but this is kind of, yeah, the closest we've gotten to a real working version of it. Yeah, if you have a nice chassis that you like and you can just keep swapping out the computer yeah. component, then then that'd be pretty nice because they do upgrade those every freaking year. I don't know. We I guess we need a new CPU every year. Yeah, and and you could with that if you like the style of your laptop, or if you want to keep the innards but want to change the style, you could do it either way. Yeah. Well, uh, we've been talking about seeing at home and working from home and how travel has been uh, obviously difficult on the show and quite a few shows <laughs> before this. But if you are traveling and you're looking for an interesting engineering destination on your next vacation, Chris Christensen has you covered. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. I've got a travel place for you today instead of an app. Some of the interesting things historically in terms of where countries learned engineering are the canal systems they built, Canal de Midi in France or the Erie Canal in the U.S., or, of course, the Panama Canal, and those are fascinating places to visit. But the most interesting engineering solution to a canal lock that I've seen is the Falkirk Wheel in Scotland. And if you look at this, it looks basically like a Ferris wheel for canal boats. It's a unique solution where boats are rotated from lower levels to upper levels and back again on a giant wheel. It looks like it was designed by somebody who'd seen a revolver and how that works. You got to see a picture or a video to understand how this works, but check it out on your travels, the Falkirk Wheel in Scotland. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. I, I want to ride on it.
Me too. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm like, ah, oh, did someone say Paris, <laughs> Scotland? I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> just, just let me. Travel. Sounds like fun. Yes. It does. It really does. Uh, if you have questions, comments, uh, and you know, just just full on feedback for anything that we talk about on any of our our past shows, or you would like us to talk about on future shows please do send them our way. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. And you know what? We got some new bosses. So we'd like to thank them. Thank you to our brand new bosses, Ed, Kevin Edwards, Scott Thomas, and John Stoneham, who all just started backing us on Patreon. So thank you, Ed. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Scott. And thank you, John. That has put us up one patron over last month because we always yes. have some people that just, you know, they have to fall out for whatever reason. So thank you, Ed. Uh, Kevin, Scott, and John for picking up those people. That's great. You guys are awesome. You are awesome. Also awesome. Sherlyn Lowe, thank you so much for being with us. It's so nice to see you again. And let Aww. folks know where they can keep up with your work. Yeah, uh, I'm at Engadget, Engadget.com. I also co-host the Engadget podcast if you somehow want to hear more of my voice. And uh, I'm on Twitter at Sherlyn Lowe. That's C-H-E-R-L-Y-N-N-L-O-W. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Folks, Thank tomorrow you. is Apple Announcement Day. We will be live as usual Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And because it's Apple Day, we'll be back tomorrow with Nika Monford and Terrence Gaines of the Snob OS Podcast. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>